everybody. Welcome back to Midas Letter Live on this Wednesday, November 7th. Whoa. We're celebrating over here. Why are we celebrating? Actually, we're, we've got a mixed, a mixed emotion going here. The mixed emotion stems from the fact that Attorney General Jeff Sessions has now resigned from the Trump White House, clearing the way for a broad federal deprohibition of cannabis by executive order of President Donald J. Trump. Can you say reform? Reform. In other words, the laws are going to get reformed. But we're also sad because this means that the juggernaut known as the U.S. cannabis market has just picked up a new head of steam, which is going to lay siege to the capital wall that we built here in Canada around the cannabis space globally. Interesting. And it shall be a fight to the It'll finish. be interesting to see if the, uh, the, this momentum that's uh, originating in the U.S. this time is going to spill over into Canada, or is it going to be, no, for instance... It's going to be a sucking effect, Edward, because all of the capital is going to come effect. out of the U.S. majors, or the Canadian majors, and start positioning into the U.S. majors. That's what's going to happen. Tillery, Tillery was the biggest percentage gainer on my crude list. And are you shocked? Well, I was shocked until I heard what you told me about Mr. Sessions. Hmm. Anyways, uh, the news of the day was very interesting. And first, I'm going to bring you the news from the cannabis space. Uh, we're going to start with the midterm elections, which produced a mixed bag of results when it came to the states considering legalizing marijuana for medical or recreational purposes. Voters in Michigan approved legislating cannabis, while those in North Dakota voted against doing so, though medical cannabis remains legal in North Dakota. The approval of recreational uh, marijuana in Michigan makes it the 10th U.S. state to legalize the plant for medical purposes. Voters in Utah and Missouri approved measures to legalize cannabis for medical purposes as well. After the passage of the ballot in Utah and Missouri, medical marijuana will now be legal in 33 states. Lastly, How many states? Are there 50? There's lastly, 50, right? Ohio's issue one, which would reduce penalties for a variety of marijuana-related crimes, failed to pass the statewide, although five cities in the state have passed decriminalization. The decriminalization measures won't affect state law, but it will help protect cannabis consumers in municipalities that approve the initiatives through local ordinances. Also in the news, Afria trading on the TSX and the NYSE under symbol APHA and Perennial Inc. announced that they've closed the transaction announced on August 14th to establish a joint venture developed to create brands and products for the adult use market in cannabis. Perennial has partnered with many of North America's top brands in retail, financial services, and consumer packaged goods, such as the Royal Bank of Canada, Loblaws, and Coca-Cola. This JV with the free is expected to use Perennial's experience with international brand development and strategy to introduce new cannabis-infused products to the Canadian and legal international markets. Another news, Whalen Group, CSE-listed W-A-Y-L, and our, one of our premier clients now, has announced their addition, some additions to their board of directors. The appointments are expected to strengthen and improve their corporate governance, global strategy, finance, and M&A expertise. One of the additions is Clay Hornet, Horner, who has vast experience with acquisitions, helping with the Molson Coors merger and Loblaws deal with Shoppers Drug Mart. These latest appointments aim to ensure measured growth at Whalen Group's global expansion. Body and Minding, trading under the CSC listed BAM, B-A-M-M, -M, announced the launch of their King's Cannabis brand. The King Cannabis brand, rather, is being produced and distributed through Body and Mind and sold throughout dispensaries in Nevada. King Cannabis brand offers royal oil distillate vape cartridges, flower products, and many expanded and may expand into pre-roll and edible offerings in the future. Emerald Health Therapeutics, TSX Venture listed EMH, has completed their first shipment of cannabis, fulfilling their initial supply commitments to British Columbia, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Emerald products have been available in these provinces since October 31st. Planet 13 Holdings, Inc., CSE listed PLTH, plans to release their Q3 financial results this upcoming Monday, November 12th, and will be talking with one of the co-CEOs about the results next week. The company's 40,000-foot Las Vegas facility is not expected to affect this quarter's reporting because it only 
opened last week. However, investors are nonetheless extremely interested in the results because of the company's valuation currently pegged at $190 million. And is this their main asset? Is this... Uh... Yeah, so they got a 40,000 foot cannabis activity and sort of entertainment, entertainment complex. Activity and entertainment. Yeah, so I guess, you know, you go in there and you smoke some of the product, you throw yourself down a water slide, then you get a massage with cannabis oil. I don't know. We're going to have to go check it out at some point. You know though, what? Edward. Next week would have been a good time to go check it out, but apparently you can't get a flight. Yeah, well, you can't get a direct flight. You can get a connecting bingo bongo ping pong flight. Well, we should live where that flight originates from, then we could get a direct flight. Well, you know what, Ed? We are about to launch Midas Letter Los Angeles in January from a studio in Santa Monica. We are. We are. Oh. And so we'll be a lot closer to Las Vegas. So we'll than be this. in uh, LA a little bit more than Well, we... I will be. You won't be. I'll no. be here. <laughs> no, just kidding. No, I, I, I think, I Edward, how... you should move down there too. I see how this works. While we're not, uh, you know, on the air shilly shallying and banding about concepts in the capital markets, we can be sitting on the drink, smoking dope and drinking beer till the cows come home. Even Which... though some of our audience members expressed a little bit of dismay. Thing, dismay and disappointment at our behavior yesterday. Apparently, we were a little bit out of control. Did we laugh too much? Well, we just seemed to be a little bit giddy and high, and I think that was probably a result of the Ontario Cannabis Corporation sending me some mislabeled and rather potent cannabis. But did you notice on the brackets that they were equal? Like, I got a funny feeling that the one... I, I, I don't think we read that thing properly. Well, I did. I don't know, I'm so sure. Do you have one of the boxes with you? Mm, nope. Because what did we do with them? It's really unfortunate that we actually neglected to keep the boxes because I talked to Cam Batley today at Aurora to explain the problem to him. And he's like, send me the boxes. And I'm like, uh, well, actually, we, what did we do with them? Yeah, but, but why did they have in parentheses after those, those different alloc uh, percentages, why were they equal in the brackets? I got a funny feeling that we're not looking at it from a, chem a chemist's point of view. Well, the first number, and I don't want to get caught up in this without yeah, you the visuals. Know, you know what? Let's, let's the first number was on a milligrams per unit. The second number was total contained milligrams in the package. Right. So and they were that the second number was equal. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to okay agree to disagree on that. But uh, anyways, so what's happening today in the markets? Okay, let's, let's take uh, a look. Let's see where the action is. Uh, let us see here. You know, I think I better pull up some NDI action, first of all. Got it. Okay, now let's go straight to our, no, not my banking information. No, nope, not this, not that. And let's just go to cannabis and take a look at the charts today. So you're going to see that today, Edward, was yet another update. Look at that hook. So this looks like, correct me if well, I'm wrong. Well, three and a half percent on, on the big boy. This is a sustained recovery in cannabis prices. Yeah, and you know, and, and the point being, and, and it's sort of like a, a binary kind of situation where it's on or off. Like, you know, when, when, when we went legal, didn't matter what you did, it was going lower yep. until it stopped going lower. Right. And since it stopped going lower, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days ago or eight days ago, yep. one or the other, yeah, it's been going higher. Like it, uh, it, well, again, though, remember one of the look, catalysts look at this, for the OH up 87 cents. Yeah, one of the catalysts for the big drop. Yeah, you know, well, this is based on the fact that Jeff Sessions is now resigned. This is what I'm saying. Now you're going to see all of the U.S. operators surge in price. And I bet you dollars to donuts over the weeks ahead, it's going to be at the direct expense of the Canadian operators who, with no operations in the United States. <sighs> look, look at Planet. Uh, <laughs> Planet, uh, whatever that company Planet is called. Planet 13. Yeah, it's up 29 cents. Yeah. So this is, this is it. At the end of the day here, we're going to see surging in pricing right up to the close, which is 45 minutes away. We've still got these silly uh, mining stocks up here. The, the, the uh, <laughs> silly mining. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I feel that they're particularly silly after my accidental fat finger purchase look, last look, night, which is at, going to provide comic fodder for the days ahead. Comic fodder. 
Yes, yes. Uh, so look at T God lost six cents. Well, but it Canadian. was it was it was much lower earlier yeah. in the session. But Canadian earlier producer, in the Jeff session. Tilray, wow. U.S. operator oh, up look at thirty this. fucking dollars. Uh, that's thirty. That's that's a twenty eight percent move. There that's you go. That's A big move. That's your big boy. Right Valens there. grow. U.S. operator up nine cents. So therefore, a break in the consistency N nine of our cents theory. Up five percent. Yeah. Vivo, which was formerly. Yeah. Uh, well, let, let's put up the Vivo? big. Let's put up the big ones here, and let's just. Okay. Let's. If you don't. Uh, what I want to do is look at these things intraday, though, in the in the more technical charts, okay, well, which let's, we'll get let's, to. Yeah, we, like we can do that. But right now, so these are ordered by market cap. Again, we don't have the adjustments in, but big winner of the day, not surprisingly, MedMen. And MedMen looked like it was taking on water the last couple of days. Well, it was looking like it was take. It was in the red for most of today until Jeff on, Sessions resigned. Taking, taking on water. Yeah. So actually, what I'm going to do right now is the let's, only one on the list. Okay. Let's jump to the quote stream application, and we're going to pull up MedMen's technicals and take a look at. Okay, piece of crap. Okay, this only takes a minute, but look at. Every, everything's up except T God. T God's probably still under pressure because there is a perception out there that, you know, there's still a wall of paper, mind you, and there's also been some profit taken because the stock is essentially almost, well, almost doubled uh, a couple of times in the last two sessions. Okay, and here is our right. So now let us go to charting advanced. We're going to put in MedMen, CNX, and let's take a look here. Okay, we're going to look intraday. So look at that. Look at that, Ed. Intraday. What time did the stock take off? 2.45. What time was the announcement of Jeff Sessions' uh, resignation from the White House? 2.49. So there you go. There's the correlation. Sector-wide news Killer. lifts all boats in jurisdictions on a national basis and that's what all investors are going to have to watch going forward into this next phase of the cannabis industry so we've got the u.s seeming to accelerate towards national deprohibition which will have a sucking effect on all of the canadian companies that only operate in canada or operate in canada and abroad but not the united states it will have an uplifting effect increasingly as the companies listed in Canada that operate in the U.S. move forward. But most importantly, what's going to happen is when the, Canadian, when the U.S. financial banking apparatus starts to finance U.S. deals, then even the Canadian listed companies operating in the U.S. might see a bit of a sucking effect because there's going to be a lot more capital available to these companies that are U.S. based, financed by U.S. companies. That's the threat to the whole Canadian sector in my book. What do you think? Would you I, concur I think with that, you, you've, you've summed, up, summed it up pretty good. <laughs> you I, got no arguments there? Succinctly. Succinctly. Well, that's uh, the Tur opposite of long-winded. Tersely. Tersely. <laughs> Brief briefly. Tersely cogent. Okay, so let's take a look at a few of the other operators in the U.S. So yeah. like o or Origin House, which was formerly Canna Royalty. And is, is Origin doing a lot of stuff in the U.S.? Origin House is, is entirely in the U.S., almost entirely. And in the it's US. flying, I think. Well, look at this chart. Look what, what happened to them when the Jeff Sessions got out of there. Okay, okay. So this is really interesting. Uh, let's take a look at Ianthus, which is also very U.S. I think, focused. I think uh, I just see Juju going by at 15 cents. Well, that's That's a little fine. bit. Fine. <laughs> that's... It's back to where it started yes, end of the day yesterday. That's a relief. It dropped to 14 today. Oxley's flying. So look at Ian. Ianthus took off at the same time, intraday, just before 3 p.m. As soon as Jeff Sessions resigned, bam, bam there it goes. Now, has there been any commentary about his reasons for resigning? I guess he feels that uh, he's, he's done now with this. Well, if I'm to quote the uh, Wall Street Journal piece, uh, let's see here. Mr. Sessions' departure creates instant uncertainty, not only at the Justice Department, but also at Special Counsel Robert Mueller's office. Sessions had recused himself from that ex investigation because of his role in the Trump campaign, but a new attorney general could oversee the probe. Now, the 
Uh, the Wall Street Journal makes no comment about the significance of this or its rel relativity to the cannabis space and the fact that several more states are now legal on the medical side, a couple more are inching more towards recreational, but the, the writing is certainly on the wall for the United States. I mean, 33 states now medical, 16, 17 now recreational, and, or no, it's 10 now recreational. Jeff Sessions resigning. And I think Jeff's seen the writing on the wall. Well, I think, I think Jeff's, Jeff has decided to terminate his session. And I think maybe his session was Sessions terminated. Sessions terminated by, his session. I think Trump terminated Sessions' session. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense to you? Uh, but anyway, so there again, Ianthus took off at the end of trading today. I think we're going to see these U.S. Stocks, stocks run for a few days. I think we should really monitor Tilray. Uh, for, for the next few days, just to see. Well, Tilray is definitely the bellwether of what the U.S. sentiment is. So Is that the biggest one now? Is that Tilray the biggest one? No. Canopy growth is still bigger than Tilray, arguably. Now, you'd have to, if you're going to consider them on a fully diluted basis. So Tilray, or rather Canopy look, has. Look at this thing. This thing got to 140. Canopy has obligations with Constellation to acquire a lot more of the company for a lot more capital paid in which would make it a fully diluted basis bigger than Tilray. Tilray, however, has a lot of deep pockets that don't show up on the balance sheet at this point and could also make it potentially bigger on a fully diluted basis once all the smoke clears. But we don't, we don't really have enough knowledge yet on what's going on with Tilray. And that might be marijuana smoke, when you say with the more, when the smoke clears. That's right, that's right. Well, we certainly tried some marijuana smoke yesterday. How was that for fun, Ed? I don't think that we should do the show high. You, you know what? I think one of us should try to. Uh, so remember. you can be high. Yeah. And I'll be low. You'll be low. We'll be the high and lowest show. High low. And then we can <laughs> Hi, say. Low. Hello. <laughs> there you have it. Anyways. Uh, I think we've got someone that wants our attention. Yeah. But. No, uh, I guess I'm wrong. So anyways, uh, that's Tilray. Let's see, what else, who else we got operating in the U.S.? Well, let's, let's take a look at uh, C-U-R-A, which is C -U -R -A. The, they just raised a big whack of money, uh, Cura, C-U-R-A. Right. C-U-R-A. And they operate, I think, in 12 states. Let's see what, what they're doing. C-U-R-A is thing's... CSC listed, so it's CNX on this machine. Yeah, it got a bump at the end of the day, too. There you go. Got up to 11. Yeah. Which is still below the issue price, which Ooh. is a little problematic. Ooh, let's see how C-Web did. C-Web should have got a good bump. Afri is up half a buck. Uh, C-Web. Charlotte's Web. Sh Charlotte's Web. It, it, uh, it was, it was oh. uh, C-Web. Try C-8. Oh, you got yeah. two, two colons in there. Okay, so C-Web's C -Web's up to... Traded up over eighteen dollars. Traded up to eighteen thirty. Yeah, and now it's backed off again here to eighteen. Yeah. So interesting. So the most of the money's flowing into Tilray. That's what we're seeing. You know what? I'm going to create a new portfolio watch for Canadian listed companies operating in the U.S. and that will give us a good window onto the U.S. side of things. Actually, that's one of the new indexes we'll do. You know what? I think we're going to retire the small cap index because we've got the CSC, the TSX, and the large cap. Let's retire the small cap, and we'll turn that index into companies that are Canadian listed, but operating only in the US. Can we, uh, let's see if our old friends at High Hampton got a bump out of that. Well, good, good point. Emerald Health, I see over five bucks. Oh, well, well, I guess the answer to that is no. This started to trade by appointment, though. Did you see that High Hampton is suing their former chief operating officer, Paul Mann, for defamation yeah, yeah. based on that press release yeah. he put out? And I'm sure that's probably going to yeah. explain a lot of the absence of interest right now in High Hampton because the audience is going to wait for the smoke to clear, get some, some clarity on what direction that's going to take. Yeah. Uh, you know, another litigious uh, undertaking was launched a couple days ago uh, against Acreage Holdings which acreage was expected to go public. And it's not going public week. now? Why? Well, we don't know. We don't know. So the, the, there's a $400 million lawsuit. We don't know yet whether it's legitimate, credible, or frivolous. And who, who uh, launched that? So it's one of the shareholders of one of the U.S. subsidiaries in New York, 
launched a suit against all of the New York subsidiaries of Acreage and Acreage itself. So it's... Uh, it's Talk about chutzpah. Well, it's kind of like a shotgun approach, which, which almost lends credibility to the theory that it's frivolous, because a less frivolous lawsuit oh. would not be so all-encompassing. It would be more razor-focused on targets that it knew were appropriate. This guy seems to have dragged everybody in and named everybody in an effort to sort of call into question their integrity just yeah. because it's a sour grape. You, you know, the suit. U.S. has gotten this so litigious. Like, there are times I see companies like Google, they're yeah. being sued, class action lawsuits if you've lost. But the, the stock's at a new Google high. Google deserves to be sued, if you ask me, by every country on the planet and every publication well, that competes for eyeballs at the at the hands of Google. If you ask me, Google's algorithmic bias is clear and is ultimately going to be provable, and we're going to attempt to do that in a series. Are you going to sue them? Uh, actually, Ed, I've got a documentary plan called Man vs. Algorithm, which under which I'm going to acquire the interest of sep a few large Canadian publications to cause the Competition Bureau to launch a class action suit on our behalf for anti-competitive behavior by Google. Right. And uh, but that's coming down the road. I might have just tipped my hand. Maybe they'll inj no. They're they're not they're not concerned about me. See, this is one of the problems I have with Google is that you can't talk to anybody at Google. They're just like we are so big and powerful that we're just going to put retirees out here and pretend that they represent right. us. And then when they say something that doesn't represent us, we'll let you know that they don't represent us. And there's nobody for you to talk to. So you know, Google is a. Let's I see, see. Uh, probably one of the worst examples of corporate citizenship that any company could yeah, possibly well, they, manifest. Did, did I tell you that people are walking out of there because right. of, of uh, the, 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 the... Right. Well, this is what happens when companies get too big. I know. There's too I big know. to fail and there's too big for your britches. And the, <laughs> Google's trending towards too big for your britches where your frontline staff are starting to walk away and call into question your integrity. The European Union levied successfully a $5 billion fine against them for anti-competitive behavior. And so it makes it a lot easier. They, you know, I, uh, it's not unreasonable to think that little old Midas letter can actually induce a co anti-competitive lawsuit against uh, Google. But we'll see. That's next year's project. We've yeah. got bigger fish to fry right now. Anyways, okay. what else okay. is going on? So... So that's really kind Planet of the news. Planet 13 going by at 329 of 21. That's really the news of the day. Yeah, that's, uh, that's quite a lengthy news session we've had today. Lots of news in this session. Well, it's big news. I mean, that's some big-ass news right there. Sessions resigning at the same time that two more states go legal. I mean, if I was to be a betting man and you were to say that the rate of acceleration towards U.S. prohibition is itself accelerating. Yeah, you, you know what? It's going to happen. Well, are we talking just the medical side or are we talking about the whole thing? Well, the medical side has already been de facto, like the, the credibility of the United States saying that this is a Schedule One drug with no medical benefit has already been undermined by the FDA's approval of GW Pharma's epilepsy drug. Not only that, but we've seen patent applications on behalf of the United States government, Department of Health, from as early as 1991, where they're making applications to patent Cannabis molecules, which rate, is uh, rate, new which high, is try to stay with me, Ed. Which is <laughs> no, I'm just giving you more more f fodder. <laughs> which is clear, clearly, you know, a sign that the U.S. understand. You know, the U.S. is in an untenable position. They don't, you know, they can't pull the roll, prohibition roll over my eyes again off of the cannabis space. They can't admit to the fact that they've now hypocrisize themselves through the FDA, but they can't quite bring themselves to deprohibit it either because there's too much puritanical, puritanical hypocrisy rife throughout the legislative process in the United States. Rife. Rife. It's rife with puritanical hypocrisy. Rife. If you agree, put a comment in the uh, comments box or give me your feedback and we're going to look at those opinions in another couple of moments of banter here. Uh, today's show, we don't have a lot of in the way of guests. We have uh, we have uh, a, the gentleman from uh, what was uh, Jeff Jeff Hawking is going to be here from uh, Jeff from, Sessions. Uh, Look Horizons at this canopy's almost back to sixty ETF. bucks. ETF. We're going to have uh, Karim Malik's going to be here from uh, Biome Grow. Biome Grow put out a press release today <clears throat> announcing that they had uh, actually done the biggest deal with the Eastern. 
uh, Canadian provinces for supply yet. And Suzanne, that press release is coming right this way. So Karim Malik's going to be here at 3.30, correct? And so in a moment, we'll talk to him. Um, and then apart from that, we are just going to uh, discuss some of the developments in companies that in the news flow that we know. So we're going to look at Emerald Health's uh, first shipments of cannabis to supply to Newfoundland and Labrador. We're going to talk a bit about Body and Mind's King Cannabis brand. And uh, we're going to look at the new, gov uh, the new directors who've been added to the board of Whalen Group. Um, Whalen Group making great strides forward in improving their corporate governance after issues earlier this year. Um, but that's what actually makes this thing a buying opportunity if you concur with the theory that the corporate governance is what has prevented them so far from enjoying the rising tide that has lifted all the cannabis boats. And Freya, yeah, we're going to look at Freya and Perennial and talk about what they've done. And uh, is our guest here, Suzanne? 328, no guest. All right, so we're going to toss right so now to a... Uh, should I, uh, what, what should I do? New uh, studies show, actually, Ed, that THC might be used to treat people with ADHD. Do you think you could benefit from... <laughs> <laughs> well, how did I do yesterday? Uh, well, let's just say that your ADHD was in, uh, on, in under, under control. control. Yeah, whereas mine... Wait, is there an echo here? What? Echo. Anyways... There's new studies showing that the THC might be used to treat people with ADHD. Have I already mentioned that? Without the side effects of Ritalin and Adderall, which let's just point out because Big Pharma, slap, slap, slap. Again, two products that cause more problems than they solve. Anyways, our reporter Adamo Barbieri has this to say. Since legalization in 2001, medical cannabis has been used by patients across the country to treat a variety of different symptoms. And now there might be some exciting news for people suffering from attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hyperactive disorder. ADD and ADHD are prevalent in children and adolescents and are typically treated with stimulant medications such as Ritalin, Adderall, and many more. But how do these drugs affect the children using them and is there room for medical cannabis in their treatments? After a couple of days being on the medication, I do remember myself being much more lethargic, uh, not running around as much, not talking as much, but it was too much, uh, too much to the point that I was not talking at all and I was not moving at all. And uh, after about a month or so on Ritalin, um, at least this dosage of Ritalin, it was my marks were suffering and uh, my teacher also noticed the marked behavior, so uh, something else had to be done. Meanwhile, many studies are currently underway to understand the effect of cannabis on people who suffer from ADD and ADHD. According to some medical professionals, THC works differently in people with ADD and ADHD versus those without the attention disorder. Patients with ADHD have an endocannabinoid deficiency causing restlessness, impulsivity, and inattention. THC works by stimulating the endocannabinoid system. It slows down the speed of the neural transmission, which allows the cerebral cortex to focus and concentrate on one or two of those impulses, rather than being overwhelmed by a large amount of neural impulses coming to the brain. But there is still a lot of research to be done on whether THC is the best treatment and how it affects a child's development. So as a clinician scientist, I'm interested in science and clinical medicine. So let's look at the science of it. Since many of the drivers for ADHD are not as well understood as we want, there's not a lot of evidence of linking cannabinoid receptors with ADHD. So on the biology, on the biology side, not much suggesting this could be helpful. Do I think we shouldn't do the research on it? No, I think we absolutely need to do the research on it. Would I use it without research? No, I don't think we should. That's, I don't think that's prudent. And while the research is still incomplete, some adults with ADHD are using different forms of cannabis to combat the side effects from traditional medications. There are some of my patients who swear by the fact that the Ritalin was poison or swear that the Ritalin had a very negative effect and are finding very good therapeutic benefits with cannabis. And as I said, so long as it's being done in a, a ordered way where they've tried some of the first line options, I think again, there are potentially some people who find greater focus, greater ability to sit still and uh, focus in on things uh, with cannabis. 
patients are increasingly concerned about pharmaceutical approaches, struggling with some of their side effects, and so I do think there is a subset of patients where first-line therapies was not appropriate and cannabis in a controlled way might be beneficial. One of the patients that I see, uh, he says weekdays, I don't mess around, Ritalin, Concerta, I need that focus. Uh, weekend, I, I want my appetite, I want my sleep. I find that kind of uh, PR, you know, as needed dosing of inhaled cannabis or, or an oil throughout the day where I don't need to be as sharp and helps me avoid some of the symptoms, that uh, the side effects that I know the medications carry. Those first line approaches do have potential harms, uh, do have some side effects, uh, and so again, keeping the, center, the patient at the center of this, using uh, some protective measures to at least dose cannabis more appropriately, um, find that balance between the therapeutic effects of both of their medications is probably the right approach. For Midas Letter Live, I'm Adamo Barbieri. Sorry, ADHD what? Anyways, what were we just talking about? Who was that? Oh yeah, anyways, my next guest is Karim Malik. He is the CEO of Biome Grow. And Karim, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, Biome put out a pretty impressive press release that you have uh, executed a supply agreement with the provinces of Newfoundland and Labrador, which is the biggest one done to date among all Canadian LPs. The uh, largest in the line of Canada. I think it's in the top four or five in all Canadian LPs. So okay. it, it goes beyond a supply agreement. So when you, we, you hear a lot about supply agreements to market today, and those are, let's say, the LCV or the OCS here in Ontario will ask an LP, right, we need product for this and this month. Give us, that's a supply agreement. And then two months later, they're going to ask for more. This is a 20-year economic agreement with the province of Newfoundland. It's got kilograms in there. It's got five retail locations in there. It's got a payback on CapEx as well. So it's, it's, it goes well beyond your run-of-the-mill supply agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so bottom line, what does that mean to the balance sheet in, uh, in the next quarter? Sure, we could probably do, uh, purely based on this, if we deliver everything we're going to deliver, it's $40 million of revenue initially, $100 million of revenue starting in 2020, another $100 million of revenue starting in 2021 for a company of our size. That's pretty sizable. So uh, we, as we've talked about in this program before, we're building a different sort of cannabis company which has a different risk profile. And what I mean by that is, as we finish building our facilities, our goal is to have production sold out for years to come before the facilities are being are finished being constructed. So we're going to be very both domestically and overseas. So we're going to be sold out for years to come, and that's a very different risk profile than you know putting a hundred half thousand half a million square feet in, Canada, in Ontario and hoping there's a market for it this year, next year, and maybe the year after. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting idea. Um, I'm wondering what the you know in terms of the capex relative to selling out for years going forward. There must be some exposure to the concept of the, the price of cannabis uh, going down while you're still constructing. And is, is there a risk that, you know, you finish your facility, your supply agreements going out, suddenly need to be adjusted because the price of cannabis has collapsed while you're finishing yeah. your facility. So the uh, supply agreement calls for volume. It doesn't call for pricing per se. There's some price targets in there just so we can get the math figured out in our head and plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we're going to have a significant drop in supply in prices on, until there's a supply I I increase. And that's on 2020 still my sort of forecast for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, until then, we're going to have some pretty interesting prices. Uh, plus, uh, we're supplying this out of a variety of facilities. So we have a good mixture of greenhouse, indoor and outdoor grow that can uh, meet the demand. So it's a good mixture. But at the end of the day, uh, the facility we're building in Newfoundland, half the production coming out of there is not for Newfoundland. We're oversizing it because we, because of this package. It's for overseas markets, and uh, hmm. those are medical markets, and uh, pricing there is dramatically different. As we mentioned before, we're primarily a medical cannabis company overseas with a bit of recreational in Canada. This is just our first recreational. Okay, aspect. so does that imply that your facility in Newfoundland is GMP? It will be. It will it's be. under construction, okay. yes. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so what's the total footprint of the Newfoundland facility? It's 168,000 square feet, but it's a very next generation sort of building. It's, um, let me just put it this way, you probably get about twice as much product out of there than you typically could on your average 168,000 square feet in Canada. And the way we do that is automation. Automation like you haven't seen in Canada to date. So there's supply shortage going on right now in, in, in Canada. You can blame Health Canada all you want, but the real blame should be with LPs, uh, some of our former clients as well, they built very rudimentary facilities where you can't get consistent product out the door for you know years to come after you finish a building. Mm. And if you look at any other consumer product out there, uh, it's highly, highly automated. Or any other parts of agriculture, right? Let's say you grow tomatoes or grapes indoors. So is that margins. why there was such a shortage at the Ontario Cannabis Store immediately 
uh, following legalization on October 17th? Yeah, the, 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 the first couple of days of shortage, the current shortage was for structural reasons. That's going to clean up in the coming weeks. But after it cleans up and people's inventories, inventories that they're sitting on actually work through their retail channels, mm -hmm. there'll be a shortage, a start and stop shortage all through 2019. And that, the reason for that is you hear about a million square feet or half a million square feet. There's no real product or consistency coming out of that square footage anytime soon. And it's just because of the way the facilities are built. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're trying to address that by building a very different sort of uh, cannabis facility, particularly in Newfoundland, where it's highly automated. So when the lights turn on day one, you know, you know what you're getting six months down the line, for example. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what's the extra cost involved with building such a next generation automated it, facility? It's more expensive, but uh, you save dramatically on the OPEX as well. So what's interesting is you can get the quality of an indoor facility but the uh, operating profile of a greenhouse. So for example, if you're targeting a dollar a gram in a greenhouse environment, you can achieve that indoors. You gotta spend a bit more upfront to do it. Mm -hmm. and you gotta know what you're doing, but you, you still save on the OPEX out of it. So it, it's worth doing. Sure. A lot of the LPs uh, have been suffering from you know, crop failures yes. as a result of pests. And so I'm curious as to what extent next generation automation actually mitigates against the the potential of catastrophic crop failure due to pests or mildews or yeah. or other things. You can do that a few ways. Uh, one way is uh, you engineer the human being out of the equation as much as possible when it comes to growing. We're just dirty animals, aren't we? We are. <laughs> and we're the largest variable when it comes to these systems, right? right. So an LP, if they go from a 50,000 square feet building to a 100,000 square foot building, what they currently do is they double the footprint and they double the headcount. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, what happens is the uh, the variability in your system suddenly doesn't go up linearly, it goes up exponentially. So suddenly mm -hmm. the entire 100,000 square feet doesn't work anymore. So right. you gotta relearn it all over again. So the more you can take people out of the equation, the better. Plus also having small artisanal sized grow rooms instead of large sea of green uh, grow rooms makes mm -hmm. a dramatic impact in terms of quality and and, and, and things uh, going wrong. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're, you're focusing on more modularity? Absolutely. Oh, that's interesting. That also protects you from entire crop loss because exactly. if you get some problem in one room, doesn't affect the rest of the place necessarily. Right, and what's interesting is every strain that you grow has a very different secret sauce or uniqueness to it. So beyond just uh, you know lights and, uh, and and HVAC, it's also air pressure and a few other things that you put into it. And and you know you can't if you have several crops in a room, it, it just not, you're not going to grow a quality product, which is why the black market still has better quality product. It's a dirtier product, and who knows what the provenance of it is, but it's a higher quality product in terms of percentages also in terms of consistency, because they grow in smaller artisanal sized grows, which are easier to manage. Mm -hmm. So you can have a large building, but if you modularize it into smaller, small units, uh, it's easier to manage than, it's, it's a little unintuitive, but it's easier to manage at the end of the day instead of upfront mm -hmm. and you get quality. And plus when you add machinery to it, that adds to it more. Okay, so how does that modularity affect cost per unit of production and also ultimately margin? Uh, again, we can get, we we can achieve uh, indoor quality at a greenhouse uh, cost point. Okay, it's just really? it, you've got to know how to do it though. Okay, so so I just not to belittle the point, yeah. but you're telling me that the sea of green wide open concept is exactly as cost effective as the modular concept if it's automated to a certain standard. Yes, if okay. you uh, if we do our job properly, we can mm -hmm. hit the same cost points at a higher quality than a sea green. The only advantage of sea green dramatically cheaper to build on, on a CapEx basis. Right. And also your SOPs are probably about 10% as big as they are ours. <laughs> right, so right. There are complications in the process, but if you know what you're doing, okay. uh, it pays off the end of the day. Okay, so looking at the chart here on the NDI yes. uh, for the last three months. So you guys started trading, what was this, back in? Uh, about a week or two before legalization. A week or two before legalization. So, uh, you know, you have not been able to capture the you know the broad market uh, in terms of you know real enthusiasm for your company. How are you going to turn this chart around in the uh, quarters and months ahead? No, fair enough. I mean, uh, so it's a bit frustrating because we did announce this. Ma we've announced a few small things since we went public. We've been pretty newsy. Uh, we've got some decent coverage as well in terms of following, but we're still a stock that nobody knows about. Right. And if you look at the overall cannabis space, right, most of the oxygen gets sucked out by the top five or six guys. Mm -hmm. The next tier, the tier after that are just, uh, you know, it takes a while to let the market know you exist and what you're doing differently, right? Mm -hmm. So when we announced something like this on Friday, our big Newfoundland agreement, it just looks bizarre for a company of our size to be announcing something so large. So it doesn't make any sense. So it takes a while for us to educate the public that, you know, this is really a legitimate, uh, you know, agreement. It's not something fluff where we're just inventing numbers. These are government numbers sitting in this press release, not ours. Right. Right. So there's that going on. Plus, we've got, this is a table setter for us. We've got uh, several other large things coming before the year is out. So it's just a matter of letting the world know we're a bit of a different uh, cannabis play than uh, what's, what you've seen so far. A different beast. Well, that's Absolutely. why I'm interested to look at the chart. I look at that and go, well, this is either a great opportunity 
or you know something that's going to take a little bit longer to capture the imagination of the broader space. What are you guys doing in terms of getting the message out to the broader audience? Well, we've got a pretty comprehensive sort of uh, IRPR strategy. We okay. used to be our investment bankers. <laughs> right. There's a way to do aftermarket support. Sure. Uh, the problem is we are still like a roughly $100 million market cap, right? And uh, to get uh, you know some people interested, you've got to have larger liquidity. Now, our biggest problem is we've got a small float okay. in terms of uh, you know who can trade or not. So. Liquidity is going up every day. That's going to dramatically change. So when you couple that with some really large announcements coming in the next few weeks, I think it'll pair well together. And just working against the inertia of this uh, unfavorable market right now. Uh, uh, so the way I sort of position ourselves right now is you've got the large guys, which you can make an argument are you know overvalued or undervalued. Uh, what I would like to say is the $500 million and less market cap ca cannabis companies right now, we are the least risky place. If you're looking for the next wave of things that haven't gone on a run yet now, we can get, we can, you can catch that wave with us with considerably less risk than pretty much any of our peers out there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. So is there any ambition then to, you know, capture opportunities elsewhere in the world? I mean, you did mention yes. that you've got uh, ideas for exporting. Do you have actual permits or, or distribution in any other countries? Right we got now? some stuff percolating. So okay. what I'll tell you this way is in, in the next two years, if we're not doing the bulk of our cash flow overseas, uh, something dramatically has gone wrong in our execution. Hmm. So if we're having this conversation, let's say a couple of weeks from now, uh, you'll see quite a bit of our international sort of uh, play. Again, we're doing internationally very differently than everyone else is. Oh, okay. And you'll see why shortly. Interesting. That's intriguing to hear. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, a little bit more optimistic about your guys' chances and opportunity because you guys are investment bankers from the industry. You've had a ringside seat for the unfolding of this whole sector. So I got to think that you guys, your guys chosen play has got to have some bells and whistles yeah. that other people have an already. I give you a slight flavor for what it is okay. in case you want a bit of a preview. So if you look at uh, the larger companies that have the bandwidth to go overseas and do something, mm -hmm. uh, they're focused on all the same markets, right. Western Europe, uh, Brazil, Central America, maybe Australia, which are all excellent markets, by the way. But I have no ambition of being the 20th company into, into Germany or the, uh, or I don't know, the seventh or eighth company into, into Costa Rica or, or, or something like that. Uh, we're going where other people are not and being the first in the door. And that gives you certain rights and privileges you wouldn't typically see in these three countries with populations dramatically larger than Canada, right? China? Couldn't tell you right now. <laughs> Sadly, we're public. If we were private, we could have that conversation. Right. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the point is, huh. is yeah, and that's medical, right? And, right. And, uh, so, and the margins in medical are pretty compelling. Yeah. You've got to build a lot of stuff around it in terms of clinical strategies and ecosystems beyond just you know dropping ship and supplying product mm -hmm. in a country. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've been working on it for quite some time and hopefully we can share that information with you shortly. All right, Krim, that's great. We'll leave it there and keep our eyes peeled. But sounds like you're making progress. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Today. We're going to take a quick look now at Patriot One Technologies trading on the TSX Venture under the symbol PAT. Big things ahead for this company. We'll be right back. What we want to do is greatly improve public safety by detecting threats before an attack happens. Our belief is that you should be able to do that with as little inconvenience to the public as possible. If you can deploy sensors covertly where they're unobtrusive and unseen, the public are happier, but they're also safer because you identify a threat before an attack happens. That's at the heart of our philosophy of threat detection. What we've set up here is a number of stations to show how we implement threat detection technologies in live environments. The cognitive microwave radar, I think, is probably fairly well understood by your viewers. We're looking at the introduction of video analytics so that we can detect and tag weapons in open view using the camera systems in car parks, for example. Somebody pulls a weapon out of a trunk of a vehicle, puts it in a bag, even before they come anywhere close to the premises, we've already detected and tagged that weapon. We're looking at targeted magnetic resonance sensing for detection of mass casualty weapons, IEDs, and then we're also looking at some specialist additional sensors for the detection of explosives and liquids and electronics. In addition, we have to have the software package which ties it all together. How do we represent all of that data in a really user-friendly interface which can then connect directly to emergency services and graphically represent details of where an incident is happening. We have something like 10,000 qualified sales leads now globally with 12 distributors appointed. We're moving into uh, revenue this quarter, initially what we call paid pilot installation. That'll just allow us for those first few clients to just 
iron out any uh, unforeseen issues, just do our tweaks, ready for much broader commercial rollout over the course of 2019. As a public safety company, we can't afford to have failures, and so we're doing everything we can now to make sure that we're completely ready for that handover to clients by the end of this year. Certainly the market appetite we're seeing for our solutions gets us really excited. We think we're going to see tremendous growth in 2019. Well, what do you think? Patriot One, there are going to be some big things happening with Patriot One as the security situation around the world continues to deteriorate in terms of public safety. Uh, but never mind that. Right now, we're going to talk to Steve Hawkins, who's the Horizon ETF CEO. Steve, welcome back. James, thank you for having me again. And uh, Steve, I want to jump right into the idea that Jeff Sessions' resignation, alongside the incremental uh, deprohibition in an additional few states, Utah and North Dakota, I believe it was. Uh, is yeah. that? Missouri. Is it Missouri? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, another one. That, there was a, legaliz a recreational legalization. Okay, right. But is this incremental move towards deprohibition broadly in the United States going to have a negative impact on the ability of Canadian companies to maintain the momentum and market caps they've achieved because they've been the exclusive owners of this opportunity pretty much since the U.S. has been all tangled up in this? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, in the short term, for sure, there's going to be zero impact at Canada. I mean, we still have to see an act of God through Congress before uh, recreational gets approved or even medical gets approved at a federal level in the U.S., right? I mean, um, as of the election last night, the I guess Congress could be a little bit more friendlier on an overall basis. And now that there's only two states where marijuana is not approved in some way, shape or form, um, you know, that's just going to be a continued uh, help mm -hmm. to from because you know this is a motivation of the people this is not a motivation of the government in trying to uh, enact um, marijuana uh, from a legalization perspective whether right. it be recreational or uh, just medical you know and and uh, we see this you know this is an iceberg you know it's moving very very slowly sessions was probably one roadblock um, in the grand scheme of things because we knew that he was extremely a dead set against any sort of marijuana legalization at the federal level. But with Sessions now resignation, uh, hot off the news, um, you know, that's one less stumbling block. But Trump is still not a supporter of marijuana, you know, publicly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we'll have to see. But, you know, really, this is a Congress thing and there's going to be a lot more pressure on Congress. But then ultimately, Trump still has the right of veto for anything. Right. So. Right. He also has the potential to, you know, sweepingly sweep prohibition aside <laughs> by executive order. Uh, in theory. In, in theory. theory. But okay, so in terms of the election results and Jeff Sessions' resignation, has this had any impact on your thinking as it pertains to the management of the HMMJ ETF? Um, I mean, really, we're stuck with following sort of federal rules from uh, who we can invest in. Um, and uh, that's the TMX's rule with respect to our ability to uh, invest in companies in the marijuana space. Um, you're not going to see any U.S. company or U.S. operating companies listed on the TMX. You're not going to see any of the TMX companies uh, because of the election change the way they're doing business in the U.S. They, I mean, they basically have a prohibition on doing business in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I think we're still going to see a number of U.S. companies still come to Canada for its capital markets access, you know, listing on the CSC, listing on Equitas, raising capital in our markets because our banking system is more favorable from a rules perspective and our exchanges and ability under securities law, it, you know, provides the ability uh, landscape for these American companies to still raise capital here. But I loved the ad in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, basically saying, you know, the American pot companies, you know, you are uh, giving the Canadians this great competitive advantage, Mr. Trump. Why are you doing this? Right. And please help us out. Right. And right. it was um, and that's not going to change. Right. You know, uh, you know, we've got uh, boots on the ground in so many countries from our various Canadian companies. We're building out operations already over there. And all of these American companies are just sitting there on their hands, twiddling their thumbs, don't know what to do themselves. They got these stockpiles of cash. They can raise more cash if they want to. And they could very, very easily go overseas, except for this complete prohibition on, you know, leaving the state. 
mm. you know, with respect to the way they do business. They can't bank overseas or anything, right? right? So interesting. So in some respects, the you know the fact that it's state by state is is a boon to operators within the state in that it creates barriers to entry from outside of state competitors. Yeah. But in the broader picture, it's it's very much a negative because they can't actually take this whole operation on the road in an international basis. They, they can't even put it in a truck and drive it over the border. They have to create a completely separate operation on yeah. a state by state basis, which is crazy when you think about it. Right. right? But that is that's that is the competitive advantage that the Canadians have been given through Mr. Trump mm -hmm. um, and the federal rules there. And, and, you know, I think we're going to continue to see a lot of expansion outside of Canada from the Canadian companies over this year. So it's not just, you know, backfilling the Canadian recreation -ish, recreational demand, which has been, uh, you know, had been, has been building and, you know, we're undersupplied at the moment. They'll be backfilling that from a production perspective, but we're going to be continuing to expand outside of the U.S. You know, the Auroras, the Canopies, the Kronoses, you know, all these guys have very, very active activities outside of Canada. Sure. And that's going to continue to grow substantially, and that's going to replace a significant part of their future revenues. Sure. I've seen a couple of PowerPoint uh, presentations recently one is by a company that is proposing to grow on 100,000 hectares or acres, I can't remember which, in the DRC. And another one which was going to grow on multiple jurisdictions in African countries that would best be considered as dubious at best from a political stability perspective <laughs> on you know 50,000 acres here, 100,000 acres there. It's like, do these companies really represent potentially a threat to the supply of CBD and THC as extracts on a global basis? Yeah, I, I find all that very interesting to hear about and, and uh, extremely skeptical on how that's going to affect those companies from a going forward basis. I mean, you look at gold companies operating in uh, Guyana and stuff like that, right? I mean, there's just... It's a completely different set of rules there. You know, how many warlords do you have to pay to, uh, you know, uh, be able to move your trucks from here to there? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, for, for me, it's really a focus on the countries where you see medical already being fully adopted. You see the governments on side from a, like Germany, as an example, where, you know, the German government through the prescription plan will pay for your CBD oil, you know, mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Uh, that benefit, uh, you know, why do you need to go into countries where it is so unconventional and skeptical from a, yeah. or sketchy, uh, would right. be maybe a better word uh, to think about right. it. We, I've seen, you know, even Afria has gone and made, you know, a lot of fanfare about this deal with Lesotho, which is a tiny little African kingdom within South Africa. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, I just look at that and I'm thinking, why? Like, why would you dilute the power of your message by, you know, putting a, putting a, footprint in such a sort of esoteric I don't even know place. why they press release something like that. <laughs> exactly. It's like, wouldn't you not want people to know that you're going to get your stuff from Lesotho? But anyways, I could be wrong. I've not been to Lesotho. Have yeah, you been to Lesotho? I, I'm south of there, but not okay, there. Okay, <laughs> right. Okay, so then uh, let's talk about, you know, the, the potential of these large hemp-based cannabis farms that are a theoretically going to start appearing in the U.S. as I know, for example, Kentucky is moving towards legalizing industrial hemp on large-scale productions to, you know, to capture the economic opportunity inherent in CBD extracts in the, in the state of Kentucky, or I yeah. guess nationally once that prohibition is removed. Do these, you know, big, huge operations in good jurisdictions represent a threat to the price of cannabis that, you know, all of these LPs rely upon in order to deliver results in balance sheets going forward. Yeah, I, I personally don't believe so. I still think that there's still so many significant constraints to the way they operate their businesses mm. that if there's any um, touch in any way, shape or form of illegal operations under the federal rules, they're not going to be able to to do things that they want to do on an, on, and it affects their entire business. Mm -hmm. So if you're dealing, if you're dealing with a one state represented company, um, 
it, it's really going to be focused only on that state. You don't see these companies going out and listing on the NYSE right now or the NASDAQ stock exchange because they can't do it. They don't, you don't see the Morgan Stanleys and the Citibanks and the State Streets going ahead and helping back these um, from a capital markets perspective or just from a day-to-day -day operations perspective because they can't. They're just so highly uh, focused on being 100% uh, crystal clean um, there's just no way that they're going to be affect the way that our Canadian companies do business mm -hmm. any in any time in the near future. Hmm. Interesting. So, what about the uh, you know what about the growers who are growing it biologically through biosynthetic means? Uh, uh, I think that's probably the single biggest risk um, to the the physical growers out okay. there, right? I mean, there's so much medical research going on right now with respect to production, with respect to extraction, with respect to the different stages in between um, the whole production cycle. And, um, you know, most of the big uh, producers right now have partnered with a university who are doing research for them in some way, shape or form um, to help specifically uh, help them on the extract basis or whatever. But these, these um, universities are also working with these synthetic producers. Mm -hmm. So you have the companies out there like Insys who are creating synthetic CBD specifically who are direct competition. Like they don't like marijuana producers and marijuana producers don't like them, right. but they're both producing CBD in some um, manner, shape or form. And I think, you know, they're just looking for really um, FDA adoption of those. You know, they're, they're well into their drug phase testings in all of the different, you know, with the GWs, the Insys, the Zenerbas out there and the synthetic CBD testing, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're well down the line. They're ready to go to production if they can get through the final FDA approval processes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's changing all the time. And I think, I don't know that they can produce it on the same mass scale that we'll be able to physically produce um, cannabis plant, mm -hmm. um, but they will be able to definitely compete uh, with us at the end of the day but you know sure. i mean there's been how many how long did it take for sort of synthetic tobacco to really come to stage and you know vapes and and things like that for people to use it was a very 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 long time right sure. and it's only and it's only, but it's been it's taken a very very quick adoption over the past year and a half two years right mm -hmm. so i would say the same thing could potentially happen in the cannabis market but you know that's that they're only going to really be able to deliver in one or two different ways uh, of systems of delivery. You know, at this stage with the physical plant, we're still looking at so many different um, uh, possibilities on how they, we can deliver that to you. And they're not all approved here in Canada right now, right? It's really just the plant and the oil. Right. Uh, and a year from now, we'll see edibles come online. Um, and that, and, and, you know, when vape happens, I don't know. But, um, you know, we're, these are all stages of growth with respect to this fantastic new industry that we're all living mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be fun to watch. Sure. Okay. So finally, I'm curious as to what your assessment of the performance of the recreational regime's legalization on October 17th, you know, almost universally the country ran out of legal cannabis <laughs> and uh, you know, my own personal experience was I ordered on October 17th. I got it. The day oh, you've got it already. That's I got it the day before yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And so lucky you, lucky yeah. you. one of the few, <laughs> well, you know, and I actually gave most of it away last night uh, to friends and everything. Actually, I'm wondering if that's legal now, but don't put uh, that on tape and cross the border. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. Well, that's because I don't smoke it. I certainly wouldn't smoke it. You, you gave it all away. That's right. Yeah, I gave it all away. But uh, so what, what was your takeaway from that? Has that affected your opinion of any of the Canadian sector or the potential in terms of the performance of the government operated outlets as well as the privately operated outlets? I, I mean, every one of the producers that we talk to, you know, basically really tell us the whole distribution channel because of the provinces really controlling the rules around the distribution and it's different in every province. They've screwed this up royally. Um, from an implementation perspective, none of them could agree on different uh, a way to do things. Um, each of the company had to talk to the regulators in each province separately about what, how can I do this and how can I do this. And um, so it really, really disrupted the, the um, distribution channel. You sure. know, production was there and they did have product, yeah. right? They just didn't know how they could 
get it to you at the right. end of the day. You know, they couldn't pop up a shop on October 18th and, and go out there and sell it to you. Right. So, you know, all in all, the, the distribution channel was really, really messed up to start. It has started to work itself out. They've started to figure out the bugs in the different provinces. The product is coming online from a making it more available for you mm -hmm. and, and we'll see things continue from there but really i don't think the disruption is what affected the price on october 17th you know uh, marijuana stocks generally had had a very very nice build up to october 17th um you know there was a lot of buying on rumor there was a lot of buying on just what's going to happen with the place but it's, it's kind of like an iphone when apple announces they're launching a new iphone there's a huge build up in the stock price soon as it launches stock tanks mm -hmm. right that's just mm -hmm. there's no different from that and the way we looked at it you know we had a 30 35 percent sell-off in most of the marijuana stocks right after october 17th but now we've seen almost like a 20 percent retracement of that mm -hmm. including today where it's all almost 10 percent today yeah. Yeah. so you know it's again this is not something that you want to invest in for the faint of heart. You have to make sure that your pacemakers batteries are charged up and you can go on, you can buy your stock and you can move on, you know, um, but there's a lot of day traders out there as well. Right. Yeah. So I look at it as a long term investment play. OK, uh, Steve, would you like to conclude with it? which opportunities or issuers excite you most right now? <laughs> Um, I have a few. I'm not allowed to personally talk okay. about the individual <laughs> issuers, um, and, and I and I don't give out stock tips. Though I have talked to friends about which companies I've seen and which operations I like more, um, and which operations I do, I like less. So, okay. so which um, which in the, of, the, all of, of all of the emerging sub segments and opportunities within the cannabis complex, which general segments do you think are more attractive than others? Yeah, I, I like the companies that are coming along. Uh, coming online and doing something a little bit differently, partnering with somebody um, new, basically from a university or whatever, really looking at breaking down the whole growing operation process um, and trying something different. So not just putting plants in a bed like this and putting light on it and letting it grow and seeing how much they can produce out of that one patch and then going through the usual drying process and the usual um, extraction process. Uh, I think that is a way of the past in every one of the companies needs to be looking forward on how they're going to be producing more efficiently, producing, creating more product in a smaller space. Um, and there are so many companies that are very, very specific to doing that rather than doing the traditional way. So um, I don't really care about the size of the acreage that you have anymore. It's really how many how much plant can you produce out of that acreage, right? And whether or not you got to stack it on three levels uh, and move it forward from there. So uh, companies that are really took a big step backwards on production and are moving things forward in a, in a new designed way of doing things, mm -hmm. I think uh, are going to be sort of the way of the future. And we're going to see a lot more of those companies compete with the, the traditional producers. All right. Your insight is uh, bang on as usual. Really appreciate it. We'll come back to you soon. Thanks for joining me, Steve. James, thanks so much for having me again. We're going to take a quick look at the history of cannabis now. And when we come back, Edward and I are going to dissect the market close as well as talk about our new segment, WTF at 420. We'll be right back. Once upon a time, hemp was living the rock star life. Oh, wow. Vincent van Gogh painted this famous painting on it. It was used as paper to draft the American Declaration of Independence in 1776. It was a cash crop and US taxes were paid with it. Politicians grew it and get this, it was actually illegal not to grow hemp in some colonies. Let's just say hemp was living the good life. So what happened? These high school boys and girls are having a hop at the local soda fountain. Innocently they dance innocent of a new and deadly menace lurking behind closed doors. Marijuana, the burning weed with its roots in hell. In the 1930s, the public's attitude toward cannabis took a turn for the worse. Huge corporations had a vested interest in making hemp illegal. Specifically, wealthy magnates like W.R. Hearst, who owned vast forests used for the production of paper. Get it? Paper from trees, not hemp. These guys wanted the hemp paper trade outlawed. Hearst used his newspapers to convince Americans that hemp was a life-destroying drug, just like its cousin marijuana, and the rich and powerful got their way. 
In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed in the U.S., which meant it became illegal to produce any plant type associated with the cannabis family, including hemp. The plant was banned for the next 80 years. Fast forward to 2014, when former U.S. President Barack Obama signed the Federal Farm Bill. It allowed states with hemp legislation to grow the plant for research purposes. And that's where it got stuck south of the border. Meanwhile, in Canada, we haven't treated the green leaf all that well either. 200 years ago, Canadian farmers were actually given free seeds from the King of England. In 1928, the Canadian House of Commons encouraged Canadian farmers to grow hemp. But just a decade later, we joined the international battle against THC and other controlled substances by prohibiting cannabis. Hemp became a casualty of war and, like in the U.S., was now unwelcome. While Posh and Bex were planning their wedding in 1998, the Canadian government legislated the planting and processing of industrial hemp. For the first time in 60 years, farmers were able to grow and manufacture parts of the plants, such as the stalks and the seeds, but nothing else. Which brings us to now. With the legalization of recreational cannabis in Canada, the entire hemp plant has been liberated. Its flowers and leaves can be legally used for anything. For Midas Letter Live, I'm Liz West. I love those little segments. They're, they're really quite... Uh, Informative. I, I learned something every time I read one. Anyway, so we're just looking at a chart of Horizons Marijuana Life Sciences Index ETF. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Steve's comments are always, you know, bang on, insightful. He's conservative. He's not too excitable. And, uh, you know, just look at, the, uh, look at the performance of the HMMJ. Now, here. did he say they're bringing out a bear one? Uh, he, we didn't talk about that. Yeah, I think I think they did say that. So, like, here's the three month performance of HMMJ, and you know, wow. if you had bought this ETF three months ago, you're looking at fifteen forty one. Call it was a low, and if you had it today, you're looking at twenty two oh nine. Fifty percent. So, considering the risk mitigation, like if you look at the range here, uh, the sector had forty percent volatility over this time frame, and did the ETF? More or less. More or less. But I think you're still protected from a catastrophic drop from a single issuer that has a well, screw let, up. Well, let's say, uh, yeah. Ex and that's the whole reason to own an ETF, I guess. Especially if there's a short ETF and you want a short, why would you short one stock if it, takes, if it gets taken out? Mm. You're going to lose big, but yet mm -hmm. if you short mm -hmm. the basket and you catch... You know, that move we saw from when they went legal to, you know, three weeks later, right. which was straight down. Right. Is that, is, that the, is that it there? Look at this. It went from 26 to 16 yeah. in basically two weeks. Yeah. Wow. But, you know, if, what, if I was a betting man now, which I absolutely am, <laughs> I would say that this, looks, this is starting to look like it's going to blow past the old high and keep going. Well, I think that, that might, you might be premature to say that. Well, the reason I say that is because the impetus towards deprohibition in the United States is definitely accelerating as of today's perspective. There's no question. You, so you, that just there, means that no wall yeah. of capital that we've heard from, from no fewer than dozens of U.S. asset managers that is sitting on the sidelines waiting. I mean, the closer we get to prohibition, I think the, the more speculative uh, you know, money's going to come in yeah. ahead of that wall of capital, knowing that you're going to take, get taken out by that wall of capital once deprohibition actually takes effect and that wall of capital starts finding its way into the cannabis complex. But the question is, is that wall of capital going to look for new opportunities that are characterized by new U.S. money into U.S.-only opportunities and not be chasing more mature Canadian opportunities? That's my question. Yeah. What's the answer, Ed? You, you know, I got to tell you, with the amount of money in the U.S., you know, when you, you talk about follow the money yeah. as our other... Uh, our, our sister company? Our sister... Our uh, sister program? Actually, I'd say it's our brother program. It's not really, there's no sisters involved, really. Well, <laughs> I mean, maybe somebody's sister, not my sister. <laughs> Anyways. No, but, uh, but, but, but certainly, follow the money, the, the, the U.S. money is so much bigger. Like, look yeah. at, look at Til, Tilray up $32 today. Yeah. I'm going to do wow. something here, and I'm going to pull up. Uh, 
I'm going to pull up a portfolio. And this portfolio is, uh, you know, some of the companies that we consider bellwethers of the sector. So Leeds look at, up big. I find it interesting ACB's that up big. Charlotte's Web ended up down half a buck after the resignation. So I want to try to figure out what happened there. Uh, yeah, Chronos Group uh, was a big remember winner. We, remember up a buck. we said yesterday Charlotte's Web was up from nine dollars to seventeen. It's it's it was one of the biggest movers. Mm -hmm. So maybe you know when 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 things look a little clearer in terms of legislation in the U.S., people are saying, hey. You know what? I'm going to say, take some money off off the C Web, which I've made a lot of money recently. Yeah, one of the best performers. I'm going to put it into some of the ones that haven't moved as much. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just yeah. a case of that. Yeah. Well, like we had Biome in here earlier, and it was really interesting. So Karim Malik, CEO of Biome, laid out the idea that they're doing things differently. They're not looking to go into Germany and be number twenty in Germany. They're looking to go into places and be first with places with bigger populations in Germany. So I thought, I said to him, China. He says, well, I can't say anything because we're a public company. And it's like, well, obviously, who's got a bigger population than Germany that, you know, would be considered a desirable jurisdiction for an operator in the cannabis space? There's not too many countries with greater than 72 million people in them, you know, that you'd consider a, you know, developed yeah. country with, yeah. the, with a lot of expendable income. So I'm looking at what Karim's saying, and I'm thinking, did he just tell me that they're going to be the first into China? Huh. And if that's the case, at 90 cents, that thing's a bargain. And then we have Steve Hawking What's in here. What's the ticker for, for the... Biome, B-I-O. B-I-O. And then Steve Hawking comes in here from the Horizons ETF, and he says, oh, well, I, I'm looking for companies that are doing things differently. The companies that are go not going to be 20th, they're going to be first. And so it was like, uh, you know, it was like we, we'd almost planned an endorsement of Biome or companies that are operating like that. But that right. is not the case. We right. don't own it. Right. They're not a client. There are, you know, long-term associates of ours, but and we certainly wish them well. But uh, you know, that chart is like it's they came out of the shoot at two bucks and it's now mm. ninety cents. So I look at that and I remember the days when Canopy Growth came out of the shoot. It came out at two no, it came out at four fifty actually. Then it dropped right away to two seventy five. They did a financing way lower than that. The last financing done before it really took off was at seventy seventy or ninety cents. I can't remember now. But you just got to ask yourself, as one of these 90 sub dollar per share opportunities got the potential to become the monster that it could be. Now, I want to talk about a company that has this potential, I think, and I'm going to tell you why. And first of all, full disclosure, this is my largest single position in the cannabis space. And the company is, uh, is now called, well, it's now... Uh, heritage. So C A N N on the C S C is the symbol. These guys just concluded a uh, acquisition. This, this is your biggest position. Yeah, these guys just concluded an acquisition of uh, of Canicure, which was a private company I was working with to uh, you know to help them acquire capital and find a buyer. Well, was they this, found was a this buyer. up today? Uh, today, well, let's see if we look at the five day. It was up slightly the last time I looked. So yeah, okay. So it's a trading at twenty four. How many cents. shares traded today? Seven hundred and forty one thousand. Oh wait, let's see here. No, that's incorrect. I'm looking at the five day. Oh yeah, okay. So let's see here. Actually, you know what? This is not a reliable method of looking at that. So. I'm going to actually, oh, never mind. We'll come back and look at that later. But uh, so this stock's now 24 cents. They've acquired a company that has 122,000 square foot former GMP pharma plant in the free trade zone of Fort Erie, but they also have an option on a 3.4 million square foot greenhouse that currently produces $20 million a year of peppers, cucumbers, and tomatoes. So the thing I liked about this thing is that you could take this greenhouse and you could sow it with a hardy variety of cannabis that you're not going to get the premium dried flower off of necessarily, but you can grow 100,000 kilograms of extractable you know, feedstock for a lot lower than all of these guys with expensive lights, fans, HVAC, etc. So this greenhouse is really you know, built for growing vegetables and whatnot. Cannabis. How many shares outstanding in this, this one? Well, now after the acquisition closed, it's over 400 million. 
At 20 cents, so it's a $100 million market cap. It's a $100 million market cap. At 25 cents, yeah. 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 So they've got, but they've got other, they've got other companies, they've got other, they're selling and growing, well, I don't think they're selling it, but they're growing cannabis. Clint Sharples is now the CEO of the combined entity, and he'll be in for a chat this week. But again, full disclosure, we're not to be trusted here because we own it. And right, right. love it. Lots of, lots of, uh, right, right there, there's a nice basing pattern from, uh, the 22nd of October yeah. between 21 and 24. If it can get through 25, 26 on some volume, yeah. it may just pop to 30. Yeah. Uh, but that'll put a smile on your dial. That'll put a smile on the dial. Boy, oh boy, where'd you pull that one out of, Ed? Out of See? This rapid. is what happens when you, we don't smoke cannabis during the show. We snappy one-liners, cogent analysis. I'll have the turtle soup and make it snappy. <laughs> oh! Not to, uh, you know, Ed, we're going to start a new segment in uh, three minutes. And this segment's going to be every day at 420 now until we get back to the products, new product of right, the day at right. 420. What's, what, what's going to be the 420 segment? The 420 segment's going to be called WTF. WTF. And World Trading Federation. Federation. Yeah. No. World Tennis Foundation. No. Uh, no. Windy. What the? <laughs> what the? Exactly. So um, we're going to talk about the labeling inconsistencies oh, here. Oh, the, 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 the packages over there. Yeah. Now you had a chat. Would you mind? I'll, I'll go get it. All right. Okay. Thanks. Oh, okay. Suzanne's going to get it. Look at that. And so you had a chat with Prudhoe. Yeah, he, he seemed to think that uh, he was a little per perplexed as well. But, right. But I mean, you know, it, 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 may, you. it may mean that, that a, uh, uh, one of those substances... You don't need as much to have the same effect. Is that what that could possibly mean? Well, uh, you know, I talked to actually I had a quick chat with Cam Batley about it today too, and he was uh, surprised by what I told him about the packaging. Was he, he miffed? Uh, well, he was. He was actually, you know, as usual. Every time you talk to Cam, he's doing a million things at once. He was busier right. than hell. So he, he. But he's definitely surprised. And he never he never loses his cool, and that's kind of one of the things I love about him. He's able to multitask without getting huffy. And uh, but anyways, he was surprised and perplexed, and asked me to take a screenshot of the package and forward it to him and his crew so that they could get to the bottom of this. Was he flummoxed? He was momentarily flummoxed. Yes, he's like, that doesn't sound right, James. Why are you telling me this? And I'm in the middle of all these things. And right. I said, well, you know, we, because we're confused. We're confused. Yeah, yeah. We want to know. So, uh, again, if you have an opinion about that, so the WTF moment of today is like, why is it that this says 2.5 milligrams per unit of total THC and one milligram per unit of CBD while claiming to be a balance of CBD and THC on the upper label. So we're going to look to the Ontario Cannabis Store for a reason. And in fact, I'm going to call their helpline tomorrow and try to get an answer. So we'll see what they say. But anyways, that's my WTF moment of the day. The, yeah, you know what? Took all I, of I, like, I like this segment. A WTF minute. The, the, now we've just got to cover another 20 minutes and talk about what happened in the market today, Ed. Well, we were you buying? Tell you were you happened. selling? Did you, you buy any stock today? Uh, no. Did you sell any stock today? Mm, I, I, I sold some and I bought some, yeah. Oh, so you did buy some? Well. Come on. <laughs> you got to be straight up here. You, you, know, you know you're on camera. Really? <laughs> People are going to question your integrity. You know, the, the, you know, the no, Latin, I didn't buy any. There's a well, Latin yes, phrase, in camera. In camera, which means out of camera. Exactly. <laughs> so you might say, you're... In, I'm on camera. Yeah, and I'm in camera. Well, if the camera's not on you. But actually, in camera means out of out of It the means room. hidden. Yeah. It means... Like, it, Do you think I, they meant to say uncamera? Yeah, you, know you know what? They probably didn't know what a camera was back then. I think it might be Italian, because in camera would be equivalent to uncamera in English. Anyways, we digress. We digress. But, but for instance, let's discuss this in my chambers. That would be in camera. Well, that's, yeah. That's the judge Unless said you that. had a camera rolling in there, in which case it would be in camera, yeah. on camera. Yeah. Okay, you know what we haven't done yet? And uh, let's, uh, let's cut away from the uh, H N HDMI. Oh. The I, NDI. It's 20 after. It's 20 after, you know, Ed. This one day is winding down. It's much winding clearer. down quickly. Did you notice that yesterday when we were all high and goofy on our show, that the show seemed to take forever? Uh, it, and we were really hard pressed to keep it alive.
So we got some criticism from that from some of our audience members. And we've taken it to heart. We've taken it to heart. And you know, in fact, we're going to save getting high for after the show, but never before or during the show. So thank you for your constructive criticism, everybody. But remember, this is an experimental environment where we get to do whatever the fuck we want. So I'm not guaranteeing that there will not be additional goofy bits coming. Why does Pat always insist on calling in the middle of the show? Still on the show. <laughs> you know what? Next time, I think he'll want you to take the call and we're going to interview him you just for his insolence. Pat, just in case you're watching, which obviously you're not, or maybe he is watching. No, he's watch not this. watching. I'm going to call them and we'll get Eddie to pick up his phone on the show and he's yeah, sitting with this. a bunch of guys. And he's around probably a bar. laughing right now. He said, I told you I'd get him to pick up the phone. Anyway, so let's take a quick look at our uh, audience here because I want to see what okay. the effect was of yesterday's goofiness. How many people we have or have not who might be tuning in just to see are those guys going to get high again and of course we're not because no uh, no no let's just say that little experiment was uh, it was fun it was fun but uh it was not something that uh you know i think we want to do again what i what so oh I, look at that we went up by 100 subscribers <laughs> one day that's a good sign really, really? <laughs> yes yeah wow yeah. so uh mm. let's see Right now, watching 153. That's about average for a Wednesday, I guess, on the uh, on the on the uh, YouTube. Let's see what the Facebook looks like here. Anyways, we'll come back to your comments in just a second. Give me one sec. We want to look at why the isn't uh, that Cura, which it was raised for half a, mil a billion dollars Canadian, it was actually down a couple of ticks today. Yeah, and I'm surprised because they operate in the U.S. Who Cura Cura Leaf. That's the one that they, they were looking for yeah. a couple hundred million. They ended up with 520 Canadian. 520 million. Canadian, yeah. Really? Yeah. And, and it, now it's and not it, moving. And it tanked uh, the day it came out. Yeah. And then rallied right back to the issue price. Yeah. That's one of those uh, private companies trading on a private company trading on a public exchange where the few shareholders. OH. Do you know that one? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I own it. I bought it the other day at uh, 970. And here it is at 1048. Jeez, that's not a bad, almost 10% win there, but, uh, you know. You're going for Origin more. House, as it's now called. Party so tomorrow night? We're going to a party of theirs tomorrow night to see some of their new brands and get the update on what's happening in the United States. Can and, they uh, give out samples? Can, can a company give out samples of a... I don't know. I imagine we'll find out tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. We'll find out tomorrow. In fact, uh, we're going to have Mark Lustig in here on Friday. Where's the party? Uh, can you say? I don't think I should. Okay. Because I don't think they want... You know, just everybody. Or you can tell everybody there. there's a party. And, and to be honest, I can't actually remember. I remember seeing the email telling me where the party was, but I can't remember where it is. So the okay. answer is, can I tell you? No. Why? Because I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, okay, so we have a smaller audience on uh, 13 watching on Facebook right now, but they never... Uh... Oh, here, <laughs> Maxim Zavit. You sly bugger you. He says, how's Acreage Holdings doing? Now, that's a great question because Something Acreage going on Holdings, there? as you know, had a deal in place to raise, I think it was $250 million. Correct. At twenty two fifty dollars a share. They overfilled the book by, I think it was like up to $700 million, and they decided to raise the price and increase the size of the offering. So they raised the price of the offering to 25 bucks. And then they bumped the size of the offering to, I don't know what, I'm not clear on what that number was, but it was egregiously higher. So personally, I was not pleased about that. And then it caused me to dig deeper into the structure of the company. And it turns out that this is yet another privately controlled company trading on a public exchange, a practice that is unequivocally egregious for the individual shareholder. Because you have no vote. If they decide that they're going to oh. start bottling horse urine, you have no vote against that. You can't vote for that. And their shares can be bought without the other shares being bought. Well, and that's just it. Well, uh, no, there's def definitely tag-along rights. Tag-along. But an offer, but, but the, here's the thing. If they make an offer for the, the founder's shares, you don't get to participate in the conversation as to if that's enough or not. So if the founder stands to make $300 because it's only a 15% bump to a premium over the last 20 days, it doesn't really matter to the guy who holds 1,000 shares. It's going to be like nothing. So, you know, the individual shareholder would vote against that. The shareholder of the biggest pile would be happy with 
riding off into the sunset with that big chunk. So that's why, among the reasons why these deals, in my view, should not be allowed on a regulatory basis at all. A private company is a company where you don't have any public shareholders to interfere with your decisions in business. The whole trade-off in taking my public money is that I get to now have a say in how you conduct your business. That's, that's, the, cap, that's the contract here implied by going public. So that's why when Maxim Zavitz asks, how is Acreage Holdings doing? I don't know, Maxim, but I do know that they are the subject. Does Maxim of, know something we don't know? Well, Maxim's a industry participant. I can't remember. I think he had something to do with the founding of Weed MD, and he might be a shareholder. He might be actually Okay, Weed MD, I just saw it go by at a 177. Sorry? Emblem, emblem. He's at emblem. So he's not, he's no dummy. He knows the He knows, knows the He knows what's going on. So, but what he, happened was two days ago. Sophisticated. He's sophisticated. Well, somewhat sophisticated. But I'm a sophist. Mean, apply anybody with enough drinks, they become unsophisticated. Not that I'm saying that you're unsophisticated when you're drinking Maxim however I want to keep on with this question because what he's asking is not about that yeah what he's implying is is the financing in the IPO intact in view of the 400 million dollar lawsuit announced two days ago by a disgruntled former shareholder of one of their New York subsidiaries who's now trying to sue everybody associated with acreage holding for 400 million dollars so I guess my answer to that, Maxim, if I was to, uh, you know, sort of objectively look at the situation, I'd say that there's probably been a, at least a delay caused by the filing of this lawsuit while the people closest to the situation try to figure out if it's frivolous or if it has merit and is actually a threat to the thing. So acreage could be in a bit of trouble. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. Anyways, uh, let's see. Let's go look at you know, some You know questions. what's going to jump here? I'll tell you what's going to jump big. If, uh, if uh, and, and again, just, just a, this is a sort of an intuitive. If, if these markets continue to rally, that CURA, which is a U.S., that's the one that came out and raised all that money. They're sitting on a real war chest. Didn't participate today, but I, I, got, I got a funny feeling it, it could really move. Which one? C U R A, Cura. <laughs> Do you own it? No. Oh, interesting. No. I don't. I. You know what? I'm. I hate to say it. My portfolio is not as fat as I'd like it to be. Oh well, mine's uh, mine's gone down in value since yesterday. Since yesterday? Yeah. I accidentally bought a stock. I put placed an order. <laughs> open. I was trying to bid on stock, but instead of putting the price that I put at market, oh. then suddenly I start getting filled. Oh yeah. And I'm like, wait a sec, I'm getting filled at 50% premium here. And I call, and for some reason, my uh, self-directed. But, but you uh, were able my, to. You didn't get filled. I got filled uh, for two thirds of the order. Ah. And the company is one that I have a great deal of uh, confidence in going forward, and it's Crown Mining. So I was not upset. The fact that I accidentally paid 50% more than I was planning on paying because I'm confident that that's just going to translate into a 1% or 2% reduction in my ultimate exit if all goes according to plan. Now, Edward, let's finish this conversation okay. with why would I want to buy Crown Mining in the first place? Is it something to do with copper? Copper. Copper is, uh, they have a deposit. They have a deposit. Uh, it, 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 look, it appears to be much bigger. Than, than what they've, they, they know they have. And every day, copper gets used up, and there's nothing that replaces copper in Except the copper. electrification. Now, okay, electrification here's one of the challenge. World. Okay. Here's one challenge. Yeah. Where do they get copper? Recycled copper. I mean, what happens to copper that's being recycled? Well, that's, that's, that accounts for 20% of the market every year. Okay. So the other. 80% is, is supplied is new, the primary copper from mines. That's correct. Okay. And so what's happening with the cost to mine a pound of copper these days? It's going up. And Everything's what's going up. To the, what's happening to the reserves of high-grade copper mines? Going down. So are you telling me there's a convergence between supply and demand that is going to result in a higher price of copper? In fact, the, the situation is becoming dire. Dire? It's becoming dire. Dire. It, so it's just a matter of time. Well, you, you know, you know, uh, uh, you, and you introduced me to Doctor Copper. Uh, Steve, I did. Steve Dunn, and yeah. Steve is, you know, he's quite a uh, articulate. He's quite articulate knowledgeable. And, and knowledgeable Erudite. about about what's going on. Learned. And copper has been in a state of deficit for some time now, 
Mm. And that situation is, is, is becoming... So are you uh, suggesting that the world's global copper reserves are being drawn down and at some point when they hit yeah. zero, that's the moment when copper... Well, we're getting, we're getting there every day. All right. And, and you know, so anyway... So we're not just about cannabis, you've noticed. We also had Time Machine here, and, Cal Time Machine Capital. And, if you're and, a sophisticated and investor and, and accredited, days, Roman days. you can contact us and participate in that. You know, maybe. there may be something to wearing a copper bracelet because in Roman days, they put a copper coins in your water supply to kill all the bacteria because everything... Fascinating. There you Fascinating. go. There you go. The, uh, that's our show for today. Thank you very much for watching. Please feel free to sign up and comment on whether you like us doing the show high or straight and we'll... We'll observe your yeah. request or not. Like I said, this is an experimental goddamn platform and we'll do what the hell we want. Anyways, thanks for watching. Okay, we'll see okay. you tomorrow. Cheers.